climb it, there's no bigger gratification. say the Lord's Prayer, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We are back into the book of Revelation. And as we go through the trumpets, we're going to go over the trumpets one more time before we get into the pit opening. And we need to consider some things as we uh, go through these topics. So you guys will have to get used to any alterations or changes you may hear in my voice. That just uh, as time changes, so will we. We really will. Not for the worst. For the better. For the better. All too often, when anybody reads the book of Revelation, it's very difficult to put yourself in the environment of Revelation. Somebody wrote me, and well, quite a few people wrote me, but they wanted to know did I believe in the rapture? Others wrote, do I believe that uh, how far what we're really deep into Revelation. Others seem to want to be reassured through their emails and so forth. They want an assurance they're not going to have to go through all of the heavy stuff in the Bible, such as the vials of wrath or bowls. It changes between the two versions, um, <clears throat> both being the same things. Because of those emails, it's important that we analyze just a few things so that we understand it completely by the word of God. Prior to the trumpets blowing in the book of Revelation, we see the seventh seal. And inside of that seal, the, the preparations of the blowing of the trumpets do take place. If you go into Revelation chapter 7, when it first opens up, John sees, he says, and after these things, right? What, did, what, what does he mean by after these things? He saw the seals opened, one through six. And he's saying, after he saw those things, remember John is seeing this. He said, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. 
And he saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And of course, that's when 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel are sealed. <clears throat> the notable part of scripture here is to take note. These angels, the angel from the east, told the four angels who were standing on the four corners of the earth that were holding back the four winds of the earth, that nothing should blow upon the earth. This angel coming from the east said, don't hurt the earth. Don't hurt the sea. Don't hurt the trees. Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What does that imply? If they have the power, and it was clearly written, Revelation 7-2, fragmented scripture right at the end, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, then we see a controlled phenomena in the earth they were told not to hurt the earth or the sea now I find this very significant because once you're in the New Testament you're going to begin to read nations in distress with perplexity the seas and the waves roaring nations in distress with perplexity the seas and the waves roaring now it mentions all of this in one circle, basically, that the oceans are tied into the perplexity of the nations, the confusion. They can't figure it out. They can't figure it out. So these angels were given power to hurt the earth and the sea and the trees, but they were not to do it. Now that implies all these events are controlled and have been controlled when they hold back the four winds they stopped everything on earth during the sealing of the 144,000 in the same chapter John also sees a number of people standing round about the throne they were just, they were there, that nobody could number them. In fact, in 7 on it says, and this is after they were sealed, he says, John writes, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Of, this is what constitutes the great number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed, with white robes and palms in their hands. I find this uh, absolutely astounding because in the New Testament, didn't Jesus say, pray that you're worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Not just pray that you're worthy to escape all these things. That's incomplete. Pray that you're worthy to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. So how does one have the ability to stand before the Son of Man? We read about that when we went in the New Testament. It is an absolute and total compliance of the heart towards Jesus of Nazareth. It's what it is. In other words, not giving excuse in our lives anymore for what we do in our lives but the heart that lays down everything the heart that follows the lamb because that heart loves the lamb there is a lesson in this throughout our lives we've looked at the bible as a goal we've looked at the word of god as a goal right and here's why I'm going to say this the power of the living God has not been vanquished the 
power of the living God is very real. Many people have not seen the power of the living God. And I'm telling you, the power of the living God is very real. Many people have read the Bible as a goal of something they will attempt to reach. But they read the words and obtain knowledge. Yet we have given ourselves a multitude of excuses why we can't follow this word. In fact, many of us have developed a lifestyle of handling worldly things in one frame of mind and talking about spiritual things in another frame of mind. When we do this, we're not living our lives and doing those things in the world according to the word of God. Thus, we have no power. Let me give you an example that you can relate to. Throughout the last year, many of us have had situations, trials, hardships that came into our lives. Situations, many different types of situations that we tried to solve. We did. We did everything we could do to solve it. We manipulated to achieve some results. We had our fingers in it. And in all that we did, we did not utilize all the principles of Christ in that trial. Because the principles of Christ are quite simple. Very simple. In fact, I, I kind of like a scripture that's in Micah. Uh, that, where a statement popped out. Micah 6, in fact. And it says, He that showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? Question mark. And in fact, that carries on throughout the Word of God. To do justly, how do you do something justly? Balancing everything with righteous balances. That is to judge with righteous, righteous balances. That is to evaluate your life according to the word of God. The do's and the don'ts. But to do justly. Knowing that you do everything in the eyes of the living God. And to love mercy. To love mercy. How many people love mercy? How many people know what mercy is? A person that loves mercy is never unmerciful. In fact, a person who loves Christ will never stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. And to walk humbly with thy God. Mm. To walk humbly with God is to understand even if a fraction of who the Lord is is to be in awe and have deep respect for him but to know he is your father and there is no comparison between his thoughts and your thoughts and you're not trying to achieve to ascend your throne over his by exercising what you think is right in the world upon your brothers and your sisters but to understand we know very little. And he gave us away. Life here is somewhat like the first trimester of birth. Maybe that's why you hear about birthing pains in the Bible. And if it's the first trimester, it is indeed unfinished. So then, our growth, this is only part of it. We're still like an embryo in eternity. Do you think life just stops there? We'll be new creatures transformed in a different form. But here, there is a large disconnect. 
We have, in fact, become impatient. We won't wait upon the Lord. And we find ourselves in a crisis all the time. And the Lord is calling us to walk humbly with him. The Lord is calling us to recognize his mercy and to be merciful to everybody else. The Lord is calling upon our lives to do things justly. Never to be pressured. Never to be pressured to do anything in a worldly way. Lest that way be of God. In other words, all things you do should be of your Father in heaven. How does one accomplish these things? Take your chastising eyes off of your brothers and your sisters. Look within again. Ensure that your vessel is right with the Lord. Make sure of that. Never forget, this is your life he gave you for your own sake. And while you are growing, you may assist in the upbringing and the help and assistance of your brothers and sisters. But your brothers and your sisters are growing just like you are. You can only assist them. You can only live as a witness to those who want nothing to do with Christ. And in order to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to live by those things Jesus made a mandate for. A great misconception is that you must follow so many rules to walk in righteousness. That's not the truth. To walk in righteousness is summed, is really summed up in this. To love everyone outside of yourself with all of what you are. You see, if you truly do love someone, and if you truly do love the Lord your God, you won't act as much in the world as you have been doing. And when you do that, you'll sit silent on many occasions when your trials do come because your focus and attention is on the Lord you trust him that he's running your life every incident in your life was based on God's appointed time there's an appointed time for all things an appointed time there's an appointed time for violence. There's an appointed time for wrath. There's an appointed time for forgiveness. There's an appointed time for all things. If you can understand this, then you will have a root knowing that God has never lost control. And once you know that, you'll never become anxious. You'll never try to make a name. Many people right now in the world, speaking about this in the world, why do they do what they do? Think about it. When a person is pressured and they have no root nor foundation in the living God, they become pressured to take matters into their own hands because they believe that that situation will never be resolved. When they do this, they begin to act outside of mercy itself. And when that happens... Well, they can be influenced by other means. And they will kill each other. And when you know what the Lord prophesied these days would come. It shouldn't surprise any of us, but this may surprise you. As we're reading through Revelation, knowing that, this, that the four angels were instructed not to hurt anything on the earth, you have to ask yourself why. They were told to hold everything back until the seals were placed on the servants of the living God. But the rest of the people were standing before the Son of Man. Does this mean that the world and what people call a rapture happened at this point? Is that what that means? Or can we qualify that? 
Now I have to be, I'm going to be that word rapture, believing in such a thing, my mind doesn't work like that. I know that it said at the last trump. The Bible says at the last trump. The dead will rise first. Those who are alive will be caught up at the last trump. Daniel 12 says in a tumultuous time, the worst time there ever was, Michael who stands for your children, stands for the children of Israel, Daniel, for your people. He'll stand up and the dead will raise some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt in both cases and all cases in the Bible. There is a tribulation prior to that time. Don't be afraid of tribulation. You've gone through them your entire life. Sometimes people say, I don't want to go through anything, and they say that because they've gone through many things. The Lord said, Woe to you who laugh now, you'll cry later. The Lord said, Blessed are you, blessed are you, when you are sorrowful now and things of that nature, because you'll laugh later. So what I'm telling you is the first will be last and the last will be first. And what you didn't go through, if you didn't have any hardships in your life, you will have them at an appointed time. Those of you who had a hard, hard time on this earth, you went through many struggles, abuses, and everything else. You've gone through it first. You were bitter in the beginning you were went through many things in the beginning you were qualified in the beginning those who are qualified at the end are those who had it made in life those who had it made that's why Jesus continually said because these this is one of his principles those who did not go through anything in this world they have to endure something no one's leaving this earth until they endure their portion of trials and tribulations. No one, most of you, have already gone through things on this earth. You've already done that in the beginning. You were the last to smile. In fact, the only thing that truly brings a smile to your face are thoughts of the living God and his promises upon your life there are many things you're not appointed to so stay the course and stay the path don't give up now because all of what you went through will be for not for nothing those who had it made they didn't struggle they became hardened in the heart their trust was in what they obtained money they can buy anything they want. They can buy their happiness. They are mischievous. But they must also be broken. Everybody is given an opportunity. And in order to have the opportunity, you must be broken. No one has the opportunity unless they have been broken. The first will be last. And the last will be first. The greatest will be the least. And the least will be the greatest. God is no respecter of person. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Do you all see how that works? That's one of his principles. And what he did with you was qualify your life. Prior to these times, you've been through many things, so never fear the word tribulation. Never fear a great tribulation. Many of you have been enduring tribulation upon your lives. The Lord will never place anything upon you beyond that which you can bear. So he's never going to send anything or you will condemn your own spirits. You will not suffer to lose you. The wrath will come for those who had everything in the beginning. That's why he said, woe to you, you rich. Their riches come from unrighteousness. Those who have power oppress the poor. They can make a decision to relieve oppression in the world, but because they have not done so, it's a woe written to them, not you.
A blessing is written to you. A blessing. I want you to flip to Luke 17, if you can do that. Luke 17. We're going to read Luke 17. And we're going to start at verse 20. To go with a revelation study. You guys ready? It reads, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Let's pause real quick. How many times have you all heard that statement, but you didn't understand what it meant? The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. You cannot see the kingdom of God with your flesh eyes. That the kingdom of God is within you. How many have read that, but you didn't quite understand that? How many? I know there are a few. That's something most people don't. They say it's within you, but seldom is it qualified. I'm not saying I have all the answers either. But I do take scripture to heart. The kingdom of God comes without observation. Jesus says in 21, the kingdom of God is within you. Mm. What is a kingdom? Is it not the kingdom of God is in fact the everlasting kingdom spoken of in the book of Daniel also. The last kingdom to come on this earth is the everlasting kingdom. The kingdom that will stamp into pieces and, and just stamp the residue out of all the other kingdoms. The kingdom that will not be removed. The everlasting kingdom. Why is it within you? If you truly do believe in Jesus of Nazareth, do you understand the implications of that? If you truly believe in Jesus of Nazareth, if you truly believe and look to him, if you know for a fact he died on the cross and you never needed evidence, if you know he is the son, the only begotten son of the living God, and you never needed evidence, if you knew God was real when you were young and you never needed evidence, if you were the one that dodged the ministers because you knew Jesus was real and you even had respect for them not knowing who they were, there was something within you that confirms all truth. That's your spirit. Your spirits being sanctified, set apart from the beginning you are in fact children of the light you are in fact children of God another piece of evidence of all the children of God is you have limitations you can never breach some of the baddest people in here who still love the Lord and Jesus Christ we've done many bad things however we can only go so far and guilt guilt gets the best of us and not because of the thing is because we hurt when we hurt if you go out into the world and you do something cruel to someone you'll live with the cruelty in your heart some people try and cover that up for years but the fact is this the humility and the meekness the humbleness all those traits of the children of God are within you because those traits reside in the kingdom. They surface over the course of your life and you begin to yield to them. 
as they grow, as your spirit grows, you begin to lose interest. And what the world does, that's another sign just for you. You lose interest in what the world is doing. It becomes highly foreign to you. You cannot understand why some people do what they do. Because you're truly becoming a new creature in Christ and your mind is being changed. That's why. All children of the light will return to the light. That's why you were sent. So then the kingdom, being God's everlasting kingdom, and a kingdom has citizens, and citizens act in accordance with the kingdom, all of those properties were placed within you. They were ordained to be with you. Your spirits set apart from the beginning. You came from a different source. That's, that's why no one had to ever prove to you that Jesus was real. That's why the disconnect with the world grows every day. Many of you have searched and you've looked back on yesterdays, but they don't fit anymore. You desire peace. Many of you search for peace and you search for love. Why do you think so many Christians have horrible relationships a lot? They do because they're searching for love only to find out the love that they were searching for. Pieces of it reside in different types of people, but it's all incomplete. In other words, nobody can ever love you enough. There are a lot of Christians who are, they pair up and they're both Christians because they had love in their life and they became supportive of each other and they can stay together from here into eternity. But there are some Christians who have been hunting all their lives for love and no one could ever give them that love they were looking for. But now you find yourself very sensitive to the things of the word of God. Sometimes you're hurt. And one more trait of those who are truly born of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you. Often you'll look back in your life. Things that nobody has ever noticed that you've done. You didn't tell a soul that you did it. Maybe it was minuscule, but it hurts your feelings because you know the Lord was not pleased with it. And it breaks you down. And from time to time, you get highly emotional because you feel you let the Lord down. And there's something in your heart that you don't want to let the Lord down. That's part of the kingdom. So now, Jesus answering them, let's go to 22, and, and he said unto the disciples, the days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here, or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as lightning that lighteth out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. Now, have you noticed in Matthew, a lot of people, somebody asked me a question. I'm reading this in part because of a question. Somebody said that Jesus is coming from the east to the west. Now, reading in the book of Luke, you see that's a description that everybody is going to notice him when he comes. Right? When Jesus comes, and many people get very confused because they don't want to miss it. It is the highlight of their life. Jesus gave descriptions. And what he is saying here is the same way lightning is seen by all men, so will he be seen and known by all men. He will never show up in secret chambers. He'll never show up to one group in this earth. 
but the entire host of this globe, this world, will see him when he comes, okay? He says in 25, but first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. That was his generation, or the generation that was there when he was crucified. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now he's going to qualify this, all right? Before you go over the edge, he qualifies this. So hear me out. Let's read it all together. 26 going down. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also, uh, uh, so it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as with the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Pause. So what he's doing, what Jesus just did, he compared the days of Lot and the days of Noah, saying, the habits of men will continue on up until his coming. Now, listen, if the habits of men, if they're eating, if they're drinking, if they're buying and selling, if they're planting and building, if they're getting married and everything else, and there was no doom upon the earth, was there? Hmm? Where was the doom? Where was the doom upon the earth? Where was it? Because people were maintaining their lifestyles. Where was the doom? Where was it? The world's not going to know. Because they won't recognize any of the major signs. When you read in the book of Revelation, certainly when you get down to the sixth seal, it's over. But the world's not going to know anything. Now he further qualifies this. So it's going to be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Consequently, nothing ever happened in this world until the children of the living God were secure. Do you guys see that? Nothing happened to Solomon and Gomorrah until Lot and his family left. Nothing happened to the earth until Noah was securely in the ark. Hmm? Nothing happened. And the world was going on about business as usual. When we read Luke 21, and Matthew 24, and Mark 13, things of that nature, we see something. We see that Jesus said there will be floods and earthquakes in diverse places, right? Pestilence and famines. We've been having those for a long time. We've been having them so much that people are used to them. They don't mean any big deal. And what are they doing in the world? Sure, we've had a strong increase in earthquakes, activity and volcanism, storms raging and everything else. But what is the world doing? business as usual they're oblivious to it if you don't believe that look at the stories about the people that were shot people jump from one story to the next their attention span is very short in about a week and a half nobody's going to talk about whatever you saw in the news they quit talking about turkey already did you notice that all of what went on in turkey and nobody's talking about it back to the presidential elections and that lets you know people are conditioned not to remember not to meditate upon things they can't see the open signs because you're meant to see them not the world if they were going on about business as usual then the only people that can take note of the true biblical signs the true biblical happenings are the children of the living God that's why Jesus said, watch, therefore, and pray. He told you to watch, therefore, and pray. Because if you didn't, you would be just like the world. 
You'd have no discernment to pick them out. Now, this should immediately tell you that only those who are in the scriptures, only those who belong to the living God, are going to know things bother you very differently than they do everybody else. And that's why the people around you who are not Christians, you'll tell them something that will mean a great deal to you. But they'll say, ah, don't worry about it. These things have been happening like that for a long time. You'll see a significance in a certain storm. And you'll tell someone and they'll say, what are you talking about? Well, let me save you some trouble. Your spirit is from the Father. You're watching. You're not out there with your head in the sky every single day. But you are in tune and you're working toward and actually working on your salvation. And when you do this, the signs will be made known to you. You're not actually looking for them. They stand out to you. But they don't stand out to those who are not watching. That's why in Matthew 24, for it said, and that evil servant shall say in his heart, my, de Lord delay, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. So that evil servant goes back into the track where he cannot see anything happening in the world. He believes that everything is normal, right? Listen, let, let's go down. 31 or 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... He which shall be upon his housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Listen to me close. Why would Jesus? Now he just said, in the day that he's revealed, it's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be like Noah, right? A terrible disaster will befall humanity. A great chastisement will come for humanity. But he's telling you, when that happens in that day, if you're up on your housetop, right, and your stuff is in the house, don't come down to take it away. Don't turn back. Don't go down to take your materialistic things. Don't go back to take your supplies. Now, he's telling you, if all your water bottles and everything else is in the house at this time and you're on the housetop separated from your house, do not go back to take anything. Don't do it. Even if it's a, 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 what do they call, what do you guys call those things? One of those survivor pack things. Don't go get that either. Don't do it. Don't go back to take anything out of your house. It will be your doom. If you go back to get extra water for your kids, it's going to be your doom. If you go back to take your survival kits with you, it's going to be your doom. Yeah, bug out bad. Thank you, Black Cat. 32, he says, remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night. Now, this is very significant. I like 34. Let me read the whole thing. I tell you, Jesus says, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Now, please don't think of homosexuality when it's two men in the bed. You need to understand the culture of what it was back in this day where families would actually sleep up. a bed was a little different than what you call a bed today. So let, let's keep this modern day uh, perversion stuff out of our minds. We're reading in the word of God here, right? If you're on a ship, uh, the, the, even on the ships, um, there were bunches of little places where people could talk, but they called it the bed. It was like a room where everybody slept. They called it the bed. So don't get perverted. Understand what the Lord Jesus is saying here. Now, 
Verse 34, he says, I tell you, in that night. Now stop. But why did he instantly jump tonight? Why did he say in that night? In that night. Because he said also, work while it's day. Because when the night comes, no man can work. When the night comes, now he's talking about the night. And what do we see in the night when we read the book of Joel and the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation? We see a gross darkness. We see the stars withdrawing their shining. The moon withdraws its shining or it says it turned to blood. The sun is no longer as black as sackcloth of hair. So we see a gross darkness over the entire earth. And in that darkness, in that night, at that time, we just saw two things. I hope you didn't miss it. The first thing is this. The Son of Man is going to be revealed in the night. Notice that the virgins woke up in the night. They had to have lamps so they could see it was a parable. But they woke up in the night, not in the daytime. We see here Jesus is saying, I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other left. So people are going to go missing. And then he says all this and he gives you an explanation. Verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Like, where are they going to go? Jesus says, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, what is he saying here? He just told everybody. He told everybody. Verse 30. Of Luke 17, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And then he specifically states, in that day, what day when the Son of Man is revealed? Go to Luke 17, verse 30, and you read it with me. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day. In what day? In the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be on the housetop, and his stuff is in the house, let him not come down to take it away. So in the revealing of the Son of Man, he's telling you, don't go back to take your stuff, because the night will fall very quickly. Don't ever seek to save your own life. It is a done deal during this time. He's telling you that people will go missing in that day. All right? He just said, wheresoever, in 37, wheresoever the body is, what body? Who is the body? Wheresoever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Right? In other verses, it's not just eagles either, just so you know. Just so you know, it's not just eagles. What if you found out it was vultures? What if you found out it was a cockatrice? What if you found out it was a hateful bird? See, this is why it takes study. Because all things are happening at the revealing of Jesus. And that's why further in the Acts of the Apostles, it empirically states, you will be revealed when the Lord is revealed. It also states in Matthew, I believe it's, is it Matthew 18, you all, somewhere around there, that the tares are going to be gathered out of the kingdom first. The tares are going to be gathered out of the kingdom first, bundled up together and burnt. So a separation will take place. But upon the revealing of the Son of Man, you've already gone through a tumultuous time. How many of you know that prior to this time, the abomination of desolation is set up? How many of you know that? How many of you know prior to this time, things won't be like you think? This is why, this is why this tribulation, because the world, if it were so such a great tribulation on the earth, right? They wouldn't have business as usual. I'm, I'm just telling you this. So then, what type of tribulation shall it be? Because if it was a bad, bad tribulation, and you were in that tribulation, I can assure you, things would not be going on as usual. It would not be business as usual. So we're looking at something a little different than what most people think. Are we not? 
What? Would be very trying to a child of the living God. It wouldn't be death. That's for the world. People of the world are scared to death to die. Not the Christian. A Christian is not scared to die. The world is scared to die. They seek to save their own lives. So death cannot be part of that tribulation. The rising of iniquity. The bounding of wickedness. Abominable acts in the world. The greater iniquity includes massive homosexuality. Perversion of what God has naturally made man and woman for. I don't speak against any person, but the Lord purposed the body, male and female, to be this way for his purpose in order. And mankind through rebellion has taken his order and altered it. They have again corrupted the order of the living God. Through this corruption, in a like manner, has become like the day of Noah without the Nephilim. People are taking the natural uses of their body and perverting them. They're doing fulfilling lusts and great envies. Wickedness and iniquity. It truly is flourishing on the earth and according to the book of Joel. When iniquity and wickedness is at a very high level, the command comes down for the angels to go and harvest. The harvest is ripe. It says in the book of Joel chapter 3. The harvest is ripe. And so we know that wicked, wickedness and iniquity comes first. I can assure you that will wear out, that will wear you out. I see it happening already. Many Christians are praying, Lord, please change this, change that. Every year it grows darker and darker and darker. morale of nations is growing darker and darker and darker if you truly do believe in your Lord the corruption of his creation massive oppression of innocent senseless killings and everything else becomes a spear in your heart every day you can try and be a tough guy. But the iniquity of mankind will wear upon you. Hence, it was written, he will wear out the saints of the Most High. Why will he wear them out? Because the beast himself will be the head of the iniquitous things on the earth. He'll become the power, the embodied power of iniquity itself. They will cast away the words of your Lord. That's why Jesus said, work while it is day. Because when the night comes, no man can work. I've often thought about that. Work while it's day. When it's daytime, you can actually see the word of God. You actually have the word of God. When the night comes, no man can work. We're talking about a different type of night. The night of the revealing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he is only revealed upon the desolation of mankind, the sixth seal. That's why they hid themselves in the dens and in the mountains. They said, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's his revealing. You see, because the entire world is going to know his revealing. And in that revealing, is your redemption the world will look upon him and hide from him but you will point to him and say he is who we waited on but prior to that time ladies and gentlemen things will unfold at a rapid pace that's what you must understand many people read this great number that no man can number standing before the lord they listen they came out of great tribulation and i'm trying to tell you of what Jesus said that great tribulation was. Because he did say in Matthew 24, then shall be great tribulation. As was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Neither will ever be again. 
In the book of Daniel, in a like manner, the same thing was stated. And I'm telling you that you have been going through some very turbulent times, but the world itself won't see it like you do. Now, you have to think about that. If the world won't see it as you do, then we know. Then we know what type of tribulation it shall be. The world will say it's a good thing. The world will. The world will say it's a good thing. In fact, the world's going to send gifts to one another when the two witnesses lay dead in the streets for three and a half days. The world is not going to see it as you do. So I ask you this. While people are waiting for the abomination of desolation, things will happen prior to that also. The abomination of desolation is set up during a great war. I hope everybody understands that. The abomination of desolation is not set up in peacetime. That's according to the book of Daniel. It is not set up in peacetime. That's according to Matthew 24. It is not set up in peacetime. It is set up in great oppressive times. Those times are called times of tribulation. And if Revelation says, these are they which came out of great tribulation, then it's you, you, who have been going through these turbulent times. But the world does not call these times turbulent. The world constitutes those who are always on the receiving end of good for the world. The rich, they don't see the problems everybody else sees, but there are many oppressed people who, who are being tormented. The evil people who are poor, they take advantage of everything. They don't see it like that either. They're being used as vessels for murder and everything else. But those who belong to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you cannot escape the iniquitous ways of the world. To you, it is a great tumultuous time. To you it is. Because if the tragedies begin to happen in the world, natural disasters and so forth and so on, and miraculous signs in the heavens, you would be uplifted, not scared. There's something in you, something in just about every single one of you. When you hear, you know why people want to hear when something is coming? Like a, a, a meteorite or something. It's not out of fear. Because it indicates that things that they have read about so many, so many times in the Bible are coming to pass and they get excited. You have to be a lunatic to get excited because a meteor is coming. But the world doesn't think that way, right? The world says it'll never happen. You know that when these things begin to happen, your redemption draweth nigh, right? Do you know what the Lord said? When you see nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, when you see earthquakes and floods in diverse places, when you see people being persecuted for the word, and you have been persecuted even among your families, he said, when you begin to see all these things, look up for your redemption draweth nigh, for your redemption draweth nigh. He said, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. You're the only generation that has the ability to see in a global fashion all the events in the world. Many people think they're going to escape some things. Listen, if you belong to the living God, you have never escaped anything. You've gone right through it. You've gone through tribulation after turbulent tribulation. And you're still here. Don't fear any type of tribulation. Fear the Lord your God, who is the creator of all things. Understand that he called you and gave you an opportunity to be his child. Don't ever fear any type of tribulation. Don't do that. Why would you seek to escape something the Lord sends for the world anyway? He's not sending it for you. He's sending it for the world. You belong to him. He's not going to torture you. Everything that has happened in your life was for your growth. Can't you see that? He did not torture you. And he did not let you get but so far. Or you would have to suffer in the end. 
But you suffered many things already, pertaining to your growth. You see, your soul is being forged through a lot of suffering. Your soul has to be forged through suffering. In fact, and you all know, I read the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch, it says, because man has the ability to buy what they want, this is their destruction, because they become spiritually blind. See, when you can get what you want to get, you don't need the spirit. To drink all the time is very dangerous. If you drink all the time, you don't seek out spiritual things. Only when you're poor, only when you're hungry and thirsty, only when you're in a perpetual state of need. You know what happens? First of all, you don't look to the world for your solutions because they failed you too many times. Then you begin to seek spiritual things, which is your Father in heaven through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then you begin to grow. You begin to see how the Lord answers things in your life. You begin to see Him work. It's impossible to see Him if you are embraced by the world.